Well, good morning and welcome to Mount Pisgah Church. Can you put your hands together for our awesome music ministry? <laughs> honey in a rock. I'm going to ask y'all to pray for me because I got some honey in my cup, okay? <laughs> because this bug that's been going around did not spare my life this week. So we're going to give it all we got and God's going to get the glory. Can you say Amen. Uh, yesterday, we traveled far, many, many, many miles, all the way across the street to Mount Pisgah Christian School, and a team of about eight of us uh, worked an event. They had the Patriot 5K run, and so uh, there, we connected with almost 40 different families there at the Patriot run, and 24 of them asked for more information about ministries at Mount Pisgah. Can you say amen? Now look around, 24 families joining us would change things, wouldn't it? Uh, at the back of the sanctuary, you will see on the tables these little invite cards. Uh, the first words to Jesus' public ministry was come and see. And I believe he made it that easy for a reason because that's something every single Christian can do. That's the least we could do is to be able to put an invite card in someone's hand and say, come and see. Most Christians believe that the mission of the church is to make disciples. He said, go make disciples. That one word makes all the difference. So you may be sitting here saying, oh, we have a beautiful facility. We offer uh, uh, 5 million classes at Mount Pisgah per week. Uh, won't they just come here? Jesus said, go out to the hedges and highways and compel them to come in. So I want to challenge you, as you enter to worship, let's exit to witness. Hallelujah. All right, today we begin an exciting uh, sermon series titled, uh, Funny How Faith Works. Because God often in the Bible and even in our own lives uh, required things that did not seem very orthodox, but they often have extraordinary results. So today I'm going to begin in the book of Judges, uh, chapter uh, 7, verse 1 through 7. Uh, and we're going to begin reading at verse 1. The book of Judges, chapter 7, verse 1 through 7. This is how my Bible reads. It says, early in the morning, Jerubel, uh, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moray. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. Verse 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. I will say, this one shall go with you. He shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you. Important word, and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. For a few moments in our exchange this morning, I want to preach to you from the subject, does God give us more than we can handle? Well, before I do, let's pray. Father in heaven, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall indeed stand. God, as always, I ask that your word would stand mightily in me. God, give me clarity of thought and concision of speech as I endeavor to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Lord, as always, we ask that you would lift every burden, loose every chain, bind every distressing spirit, and destroy every yoke. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, 
acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer, will you get glory in this place? The people of God said together, amen. The GOAT, the greatest of all time, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, once scored 69 points in one game. Every single thing he threw up at the rim went in. It was almost as if the rim looked like the size of the ocean to Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan had the best game of his life that night. There's only one thing. On the same night that Michael Jordan had the best game of his life, scoring 69 points, his teammate Stacy King had the worst night of his life, only scoring one point by one free throw he made. And after the game, as you can imagine, the sports announcers, they rushed to Michael Jordan and they put the cameras and the, the lights and the microphones in his face and they said to him, uh, Mike, what happened? Tonight you were on fire. You scored 69 points and it was as if uh, you could do no wrong tonight. And then they pointed those same cameras, the same microphones, those same lights in the face of Stacey King. They asked him the same question, what happened? On the night that Michael Jordan had his best night, Stacey King, he scored 69 points. You scored one point on the same night that he had his best night. You had your worst. What happened? And here's what Stacey King said to those reporters. He said, I don't know. He said, but what I do know is this. I will never forget the night. And Michael Jordan and I combined for 70 points. <laughs> See, friends, you and I often believe that we bring more to the table with God than we actually do. You see, there are a few things that stand in opposition to how faith really works. And one of them is understanding this unshakable truth that on the cross of Christ, he paid and he took care of everything. But God is saying that if there's just this one thing that you must bring to the table, if there's just this one thing that you have to contribute, if there is just this one thing that you cannot leave with you, it's faith. Bring your faith to me. You see, there are some things that we have seen that, that can stand in direct opposition to our faith. Many of us have seen other people in church, or maybe it was even your parents or people in your family, and they said that they were being led by God. They said that they were Christians, but they did not behave that way. So there were things that you saw that stood in direct opposition to you maturing in your faith because you were looking at what you saw. And then if it wasn't what you saw, for many of us, maybe it was things that you heard. For some of us, it's things that we hear that stand direct, in direct opposition to us growing in our faith with God. There's this one phrase that has led to a lot of disappointment and a lot of confusion in so many people. This one phrase can be the culprit to people even walking away from their pursuit of God. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle? Well, this morning, I'm your brother, I'm your nephew, I'm your cousin, I'm your grandson right now. That ain't in the Bible. God will absolutely place more on us than we can bear. And the good news is, there's a reason for it. This story belongs at the top of the list of more than we can handle. And if you've ever gotten in life more than you feel you can handle, if you've ever been dealt a deck of cards that seemingly are impossible, it's not a sign that you're outside of God's plan. It could be the greatest indicator that you're smack dab in the middle of it. Come with me now to the plain of Jezreel. As Gideon stands beside Mount Geboa, what do his eyes behold? He sees a sea of tents in an area spilling over 
with 100,000 Midian warriors. And the Lord has the unmitigated gall (laughs) to say to him that his army of 32,000 is too many. They were outnumbered three to one. And at God's plan, Gideon makes an announcement. He tells them that if you're afraid, you can go home. And 22,000 of Gideon's soldiers packed up and left. Now they're outnumbered more than 10 to 1. And as odd as it sounds, what does God say? He says, Gideon, you still got too many. So God's plan, again, Gideon says, let the men go down to the spring and drink. All who scoop up the water to drink set aside, for this is your army. Everyone who kneels to drink, you can send them home. And the number of men who scoop the water up with their hands is only 300 people. Now it's 100,000 versus 300. And this is more than Gideon can handle. This is more than he himself can bear. Then at night, God told Gideon to arise and pursue the army. He split them up, the 300 men, into three companies. They blew their horns and broke their jars, and the enemy was confused, and they killed each other. They didn't even have to fight. So a situation that seemed to be too much to handle was actually orchestrated by God, including the victory. Don't miss that. A situation that seemed too much to handle was actually orchestrated by God, including the victory. It was a fixed fight. Hallelujah. I'll never forget the night me and you and my friends, we gathered around the street light in our neighborhood. We were in elementary school, and there under that street light, we consoled each other. There under that street light, we wiped away each other's tears. There under the street light, we tried to encourage one another. Because there under that street light, it was the night that we had to admit to each other that wrestling is fake. Y'all, it tore my heart up. We were, we were asking one another, do you think it's fake? And, and one would say, yeah, I think it is. No, 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 no. Do you, you think it's fake too? And that friend would go, yeah. See, see, here's the thing about wrestling. The outcome is already predetermined. It's a fixed fight. And that's what it's like when you're in a battle with God on your side. The outcome is predetermined. Can you say amen? See, faith only works when we totally and completely rely on God. Gideon had a lot of reasons to be fearful. Let's, let's not ignore this in the text. In chapter 6, we do not see Gideon as a person who is brave. We do not see him as a warrior. In fact, he is very fearful and he actually lacks courage. In chapter 6, verse 11, it says that Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Now, culturally, contextually, this is not how you would beat out the wheat. The proper way to beat out wheat would be to stand on the ground and they would toss it up in the air as high as they could and the wind would blow away the chaff and then the wheat would fall. That's how they would beat out the wheat. But but a wine press is actually more of a pit than it is a high place and it would have made it very difficult for wind to grasp the chaff and blow it away. Gideon is hiding. Gideon is afraid of being seen. In chapter 6, verse 27, Gideon does as God commands, and he destroys the altar of Baal, but he does it as n- at night to not be seen because he's afraid. But more important than verse 11 and more important than verse 27 where he's afraid is verse 12. Because in verse 12, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior." valiant warrior. He's hiding. He's fearful. He's afraid. And through the angel, 
God is not addressing him as he is. God is addressing him according to what he has ordained for him to be. You see, it's funny how faith works because God will start showing you what he wants to do in your life and he'll start showing you how he wants to use you. And, and at some point, he's going to tell you something that's scary and you're going to say, me? <laughs> and at some point, he'll show you something uh, that's almost funny and laughable and you'll go, me? But there ought to be at least five people in here this morning that will say, I'm glad that God did not call me according to who I am. I'm glad that God has called me according to who he has ordained me to be. I'm glad that God sees the best in me when others see the worst in me. Can you say amen? You see, they've got some reasons not to fear. Because the Bible says, 365 times, do not be afraid. That's one for every day. And this is one of those occurrences where they need to hear the words, do not be afraid. But there are pre three primary reasons not to fear. One is the first, is the perfect character and the goodness of God. Do you believe that God is perfect in all his ways this morning? Do you believe that he's, he's perfect in everything that he does? Do you believe in the goodness of God? You see, because if we ever begin to doubt his goodness, then the enemy can get us to doubt his godness. I want you to know that every good and perfect thing comes from God, and in him there is nothing that is not good. The second is that all his intentions for us are good. We are his children and the sheep of his pasture. He has already proven his good intentions toward us because he gave us his very best in the person of his son, Jesus. Finally, the reason Gideon should not fear is because this is only a test. Now, I know I may be oversimplifying this for many, but, but sometimes you and I and I walk with Christ, we just have to resist the urge to take ourselves too seriously. This is only a test. This is not about Gideon. This is about God and the glory that he deserves and that he wants to receive. So real briefly, I want to tell you about the significance of a test. The, the book of Judges reveals a cycle. Here it is. Disobedience leads to discipline then repentance leads to deliverance. I need to push rewind and play that again. Disobedience leads to discipline, then repentance leads to deliverance. This is the reoccurring cycle that we see in the book of Judges. When you and I are in school, a test could mean that we might pass or fail a class. But don't ignore the significance of a test from God because the benefits may be more than you and I can imagine. The Bible says that faith will be tested. When our faith test is done, that we will be complete and whole, lacking nothing. That's what that word shalom means. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. If you don't believe me, come here, Abraham. God tested a man named Abraham before he became the father of many nations. Well, come here, Joseph. Joseph uh, was tested before he became the governor of Egypt. God tested a man named David. Come here, David. Tell them this morning in Mount Pisgah. God tested him before he became king. When you're going through a tough situation, never forget, it's only a test for the glory of God. And here's something that God works in us. It, it's this, this, this is the sermonic Brussels sprouts, if you will. This ain't the cheesecake right here, but this will grow us and mature us this morning, okay? You can't be aware that God is all you need until God is all you have. And you can't ha help somebody else along their Christian journey that God is all they need until God is all they have. So there are three tests that I want to pull out of this text, and then we'll be on our way this morning. First, for Gideon, this is a test of character. You see, Jesus, God, God, God is saying that this is about glory. He says, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites to you. 
You see, the goal is that God will receive the glory out of our lives, and this can sound burdensome because how can the one who is glorious receive glory out of my life? You see, we're not talking about God getting the glory out of our efforts or because we work so hard. No, 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 no. You've heard enough of that kind of stuff. But we're talking about God getting the glory out of our yes. You see, we've often been told that God can get the glory out of our working, but we also need to be told that God can get the glory out of our resting. Do you see the difference? This is not a result, this victory is not a result of getting and working hard. This is a result of getting and resting in the sovereignty and the power of God. You see, when things seem to be out of reach, the fact that we wait patiently and trust God with an answer of yes, that brings him glory because man's extremity is God's opportunity to work a miracle. If they win with their army, they can take the credit. But if they win with 300, all the glory goes to God. The next test is the test of courage. Not only are the odds are against them, but if you read on in chapter 8, they didn't even use any weapons. This took courage. Courage is what we need to act on our faith. Belief alone is not enough. I can prove it to you. Paul prayed for courage because faith in God is more it is important, but you also need courage to actually act on the faith that we have in him. Courage is the audacity, if you will, that puts faith in action. And now we're not talking about misguided bravery. We're talking about relying on the wisdom of God. Here's what I mean by that. One of the names that, that the Lord has called as Wonderful Counselor, and if you look in the original language and try to discern what does that mean, what, what does that title, what does that name mean, Wonderful Counselor? And most scholars, all they can come up with is that it means that he gives unusual advice. I can prove it to you. 300 men to go against 100,000, that's unusual advice. You see, there, there's no way you can see Jesus coming because his counsel is full of wonder. It is wonderful. Who would say, go to the Red Sea, and then I'm going to part it, and you're going to walk across dry land. That's unusual advice. Who would send a little boy with a couple of stones and a sling to defeat a giant? That is advice that is full of wonder. His, his counsel is wonderful. It is, it is unusual advice, and it took courage for Gideon to act on this unusual word from God. God does not call the brave but he will make brave the call. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's courage when you have it in the midst of fear. You have to be open to God making adjustments in your life that will bring him glory. God is allowed to shape your plans. You can be victorious even if what you face is more than you can handle. Gideon's plans are being conformed. Now, this may sound inconvenient to you because you don't want your plans to be conformed, but you're probably more used to your plans being conformed than you realize. It. For example, raise your hand if you have a degree that you didn't use. Look around the room. Amen. We are used to having our plans conformed more than we realize. You see, you got to leave your impossible situation with God and trust Him with the results. The reason resilience must be tested is to show you that your resilience will fail. Because what you need in this life is not just resilience, but you need a relationship with Jesus. Because God never fails. You know, one of the things I like about Gideon is that uh, I, I'm, I, I resonate with this. He asks God for a sign. You can see him. He says, hey, listen, I'm going to put down a cloth, and then uh, uh, when I come back, maybe, God, if you don't mind, make the cloth full of dew in the morning and let all of the area around the cloth be dry. And then when he came back to the cloth, he picked it up, and that was enough that he could wring it out into a bowl. And then he said, oh, well, let me think of another sign. God, how about this morning? Uh, maybe when I come back that the cl cloth should should be dry and that all the area around it should be wet. And when he came back, the cloth was dry and all the area around it was wet. 
And I was thinking, man, there's nothing wrong with asking God for a sign. I, I'm in a place in a season in my life where I need God to give me a sign. And recently, he gave me two because God loves us that much. And he doesn't want us to go the wrong way. And I thought, what, what, what if God gave us a sign, a, a sign of his faithfulness, a sign of his love, a sign of his commitment to us, a sign of his, his total uh, uh, sacrificial love for us? And I thought about it. God gave us a sign. Check it out. There's our sign right there, y'all. That's the sign that he's faithful. That's the sign that he's true. That's the sign that he's committed. That's the sign that he loves us. Every time we see the sign, it is proof that God is with us and he will never leave us or forsake us. Can you say amen? That's our sign. I want to leave you with this. If you and I were to get in our car tonight and drive to Nashville, our headlights would not illuminate the entire way, only a few feet in front of us. But if we would just drive to what looks like the end of the illumination, what we'll discover is there's more light there. Do you see what I'm cooking? That's what faith, that's what putting your faith and trust in God is like. It, you, you don't see the whole way. You don't see all of the steps. But if you would just go and if you would just do it again and do it again and then do it again and then do it again, what you'll find is that you have arrived at your destination. If you'll close your eyes and bow your heads this morning, I want to invite each of us into a time of prayer. And I want to intercede sincerely right now for someone who says, listen, what I have right now is more than I can bear. I want to encourage you, my brother and my sister. Having more than you can bear is not a sign that you are outside of the will of God. Rather, it could be the greatest, the greatest, the surest indicator that you are smack dab in the will of it, in the middle of it. Because man's extremity is God's opportunity to work a miracle, and only he gets the glory. Father in heaven, we give you praise. God, we give you glory right now, and we say, Lord, help our unbelief. God, my prayer is this, that this one thing that we would bring to you, that, that you've, you've worked it out, you've paid the price, you've done everything through the finished work of the cross, but this one thing, Lord, we would bring to you, and that is our faith and trust and leave it and put it in you. God, we bring this one thing to you, and we know that the word of the Lord says this, no one who puts their faith and trust in the name of the Lord shall ever be put to shame. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.